folks. Jeff, my man, is in the studio, and he's going to be a real treat. Jeff Bloomfield, what's cracking? I'm doing great. How about you, brother? Dude, if I was any better, I'd be you. Ah, I don't know. You could all hope to be, hope to be so good, I guess, right? <laughs> if you guys don't know who he is, the real Jeff Bloomfield, not the, just real. Just real. Just real keep Jeff it real. Jeff Bloomfield, at real Jeff Bloomfield on social media. You're going to want to follow this dude. He's out there showing major companies and all of their sales professionals mainly, and leadership, how to sell with neuroscience, how to lead with neuroscience, how to grow and develop with neuroscience, neuroscience-based information, which is really behavior, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, human behavior. And if you can understand human behavior, well, then you've got an advantage. Now, you grew up on a big-ass farm in freaking North Central Ohio, and it says here, that's where you learned all the lessons in life. Well, how did you learn how to sell with neuroscience on a farm in Ohio? Isn't it funny, when you look back on your life, and you start to think about why you do what you do, how you do what you do. And we tell a lot of folks that the number one determining success factor in life, in business, as a company, or as an individual, is the ability to communicate effectively. Number one, you can have the right people, the right culture, the right strategy, the right product. None of it matters if you can't communicate effectively. So for me, that started on the farm. I had a grandfather, Papaw, from Kentucky. Papaw. Papaw. And Papaw was an amazing storyteller, communicator, teacher. Taught me how to drive when I was five, standing between his knees on our old green John Deere tractor. And he had these beliefs that he subliminally was imparting on me. Things like hard work and perseverance is what gets you ahead in life. He used to have- You believe that? Saying, I, you know what I do? I think working smart is critical, but uh, you look around the culture today and see, you know, sheesh, and you know this, in sales, 80, 90% of sales is just showing up. It's putting in the effort, putting in the work being willing to outwork people. Yeah. And, you know, we learned that on the farm. We didn't have enough money to pay for stuff to be fixed. We had to learn how to fix it ourselves. 100-acre farm, dude. You had to have some money. Well, I mean, we had enough to operate. It was a small business. That's how I actually learned how to run a small business. 100 acres pretty good size, though. It's tiny in comparison to a lot of farms in You the watch West. Yellowstone? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you like that? Uh, that wasn't that big. It wasn't that big. But, I mean, was, was it like that? No, I mean, it, we didn't wear the cowboy hats. Uh, we had the boots and we had... Uh, you were farmers. We were farmers. We did. We raised cattle and we uh, raised crops. So we weren't ranchers. A little different than Yellowstone. Yeah. So though I do have a little bit of cowboy envy when I watch that show. Yeah. Well, everybody does. Makes me want to move to Montana. It does, right? Apparently ha half the people from California are moving out there. So Buy a damn ranch. Be cool. <laughs> That's right. So, so Papa believed that problem solvers ruled the world. That's it. And I think that might've been the biggest lesson I took from him. I agree with that thousand percent. I tell people all the time. <laughs> but what I didn't realize till I got older was he never really told you how to do something. He kept asking you questions until you could figure out how to do it sufficiently. So he's and teaching he would, you how to think. He would cut, he would teach, he taught me how to be a critical thinker, how to be a problem solver rather than giving you the answer. And I think that's, again, that's another challenge with today's culture. People want to be told what to do. They want things fast. They want them simple. They want them easy. And they, they want kind of an easy lifestyle. And that doesn't really doesn't, your brain is not built for that. Your brain is built to be probably the universe's most dynamic problem solving mechanism that was God ever created. Well, of so, course. So when you don't exercise it to be a problem solver, guess what? You're going to be relying upon other people. You end up just with a problem. <laughs> you do. No way to solve no it. No way to solve it. So you come to guys like us and we tell you, we'll solve it for you for X. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so today you call that the platinum rule, which is ultimately with enough creativity, ingenuity, and in our case, a little duct tape that you can solve any problem and likely help anyone else solve theirs as well. Well, platinum rule is, uh, so the problem solvers rule of the world was one big belief. The platinum rule was a different one. So the platinum rule was really the customer service rule. That was the, how do you treat other people rule Papal had. And his belief was if you treated people better than they expected you to treat them, not only would it benefit them, but it's going to come back to mean something to you as well. It's a measure of your character. Two seconds. Got to take this. I boo. I don't know. I got to go, boo. 
I thought it was the daughter in the hospital. I got to take those calls. No you matter have to what. take those calls. See now a bunch of listeners right now are going, Oh, oh he's, he's a sweetie. He's not the guy that sometimes I thought he was. He's got such a soft heart. Well, no, when it comes to your daughters, holy moly, dude, <laughs> no I'll freaking I'll freaking run out of here in five seconds. Well, she's got a freaking kidney stone. How does an eight year old get a kidney stone? And I've heard from people that have had those major pain. So I feel so bad for her. But anyway, um, she's in the hospital, so I didn't want to, like, yeah, if there's something that. happening, I'm finding out right now. You got to take that call. Hey, but, but uh, and we keep this informal anyway. Yeah, you've totally. heard a, You've heard a few episodes. Absolutely. That's what this is about. It's what that's what people that's like. Why the, that's exactly. That's why the bomb squad's the bomb squad, dude. They, right. they just like to see what, what takes place. What am I going to drag out of you, and what am I going to think about it? That's it. But problem solving, I agree with. More people need to problem solve, and- Critical thinking is really that, and, you know, a little confidence in yourself. But uh, what I like about Brain Trust, and by the way, folks, he's the comp- he's the CEO of a company called Brain Trust, and you you consult a lot of major companies on their sales game and what, leadership or just yeah, sales? Leader, mostly, it's all really communication focused. So anything that you're doing to communicate, could be your marketing message, could be your sales messaging, commu- customer conversation model, could be your coaching. But you, but you go into big companies and kind of just consult them into, you know, tripling their profits just by changing what they're saying and how they're saying it and what they believe about it. You're leveraging human behavior, buyer behavior. Yeah, that's exactly it. We've worked with Fortune 500 companies up to Fortune 5 and helped them revamp their entire communication approach. But it's, it's really based on how the brain is biologically built. Most people have never been taught that. Academics, some of them know it. Healthcare folks who are maybe in the neuroscience realm kind of know it with the latest technology, but the average person who's trying to communicate for a living, they don't know this stuff. If they did, they wouldn't communicate the way they do because we actually train people backwards in a way that's counterproductive to the other person being willing to make a decision. And we don't even know it. Explain. So I spent my corporate career in biotech and I got to use a lot of those principles that Pat Ball taught me on the farm and didn't know why I was a good communicator. So I was intuitively good, like many of the listeners, but I wasn't intentionally good. And so it wasn't until they asked me me to help lead a team to launch a drug for a brain brain cancer indication that we had that I started to become a little bit obsessed with the latest technology, functional MRI, EEG, looking at the brain and how it worked. Initially, it was just for the blood brain barrier and the healthcare side. But the more I started looking at this, the more I realized that no one's looking at this from a decision making standpoint, that if certain people say this, it activates this part of the brain. Well, now we know what this part of the brain does. If certain people say this, it activates this part of the brain. And so I started putting together a lot of the research related to decision-making and how it mapped to the brain. And what I found was dispelling a lot of myths and rumors. We were trained on left brain, right brain. We were trained on personality styles. We were trained on all these different ways to think about the person we're communicating with when the reality was the brain was the same for every human being across the planet. And it made decisions inside out, not outside in. So analytical network is your outside neocortex, facts, figures, features, opinions, uh, where language is housed. And then the inside, the empathic emotional network, that's where meaning, emotion, feelings, uh, memories, all those reside. We've trained people to communicate with the part of the brain that's designed to be judgmental and skeptical. Is that the emotional? Nope. That's the analytical. Because you want to tap tap into their emotions, don't you? All decision-making, all human decision-making, period happens emotionally first to some degree. And then we look to recruit information to validate and justify with the analytical part of our brain. And that's the simplest way I can, I can explain it. We look is that at this facts, thing. facts, figures. No, I mean, is that data. fact? Fa- yeah, it's science. It's science. I'd like to read that. Well, I got, we got garbs of it. We got loads of it. Cause, cause I mean, you know, I make some decisions that where I don't believe there's an emotion involved. I'm, I'm intentionally taking the emotions out I think you can make better decisions in certain cases without emotion. Uh, respectfully, I disagree. Well, I know. That's why I'm right. asking. Because here's the thing. When you are aware that you, think, that you think you're being rational, that's your conscious brain, part of your mind. You've already subconsciously had an emotional feeling to why you're trying to make the decision in the first place. Once you've invested emotion into why you should do something different, then your conscious, your analytical network starts to process the information to make your conscious mind believe you're being rational. Okay. So let's do an example here. Ready? Yeah. What would you like for lunch? Ham sandwich or 
steak and potatoes and scampi. So immediately your subconscious brain kicks into some, some decisions don't require a lot of thought, but they always require some level of feeling. But what, yeah, where's the emotion there? Like, well, ooh, feeling and sometimes I love people steak. see some people f- mistake feeling and emotion. Like they're similar. I can have a feeling and not be emotional. So you can have a emo- you can express emotion, but not be emotional. So if I think to myself, Hey, you know what? My wife and I've been trying to eat healthier subconsciously. My feeling is I kind of want to honor her and eat healthier while I'm on the road instead of just kind of going out and eating steak while I'm not in her presence as an example. Steak is healthy, by the way. So my feeling behind that is I, I want to do the right thing because that's part of who I am, my identity as in this example, right? So therefore, do you have anything else? Do you have a chicken salad? Do you have a tuna? Like I'm going to, I'm going to ask something then I'm going to rationalize why I'm not going to have the steak. But where was the emotion in it? it the, the emotion is associated with how you feel about who you are in the moment of that decision. It may sound simple. And it's it's blink of instantaneous. An eye. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, we can go all day we'll, on this if we'll, you want. We'll table that. Well, again, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't study and you do. So at the end of the day, it may be a true fact. I just do it intuitively. That's but it. some, but sometimes, like, you know, what I'm having for lunch, I don't think I put, I mean, oh, I felt really good about the pasta. You know, I didn't think there was any emotion to certain decisions, but, but I know that when selling, you want to, get people to feel shit. Like when I say to you, you know, so what have you tried so far to solve this problem? And you're like, well, I've tried this, this, this. And how did those solutions work out? Clearly, if you're talking to me, they didn't work out very well. And, and how'd that make you feel or what, and what was the implications of that? Right. You know, what was the consequences of that decision? And you make them feel that aggravation or that pain of some way. And your freaking closing percentages go up. So emotions is for, for making decisions. I just didn't think every one, but I'll take your word for it. It's a continuum, right? Like what are you having for lunch? It might use 1% emotion, but you, it's still initiated from, I feel hungry. You don't think you're hungry. You feel hungry. That's what drove the decision to actually have lunch to begin with. It was a feeling that you need to eat lunch. So it's simple, maybe 1%, 2%. But now in a sales environment, notice the question you said, how, how did that make you feel? You didn't ask me how that make, how'd that make you think? What about as a salesperson? And I feel like I better get a fucking sale or on my ass is grass. See, that's fear. That's driven in this case. Cause I need to pay my rent. Well, again, it's driven out of self-preservation. Is that good or bad? You can't help it, but here's what'll happen because salespeople who are under pressure, when the human brain is under pressure of any situation, it always communicates from its highest level of training, knowledge, and belief. Mm -hmm. Okay. Better say that again. So when the human brain is under pressure of any sort, it always communicates from its highest level of training, knowledge, and belief. Can't help it. We're self-preservation animals. So if a salesperson's feeling pressure, they haven't sold anything in a month, they're up against it. They finally got a customer. They've been trying to get this prospect on the phone or in person for three months. And they go in there into that kind of pressure. What's the salesperson's highest level of training? I got watches. I call it the watches effect. All they want to do is talk about their product. And guess what act- activates the analytical network in my brain is the prospect. And guess what my analytical network's designed to do? Resist you. Be skeptical of you because you're selling me something instead of solving by ser- serving me by solving my problem. See, problems, to your point earlier, evoke emotion. Products evoke evaluation. Wrong network. So you've got to lead up to your differentiation, not lead with it. 99% of salespeople, because their highest level of training is their own product, they lead with it, which is why they get a little bit of resistance. Mm. Sometimes a lot of resistance. So after all these studies and you realized, hey, wait a minute, you started to develop word tracks or what? Like to better present things and better tap into certain parts of the brain? Yeah. So neuroselling was written out of the idea that, that we really wanted to put this in a platform book to show people the science in a simple way, by the way. Look, we're not trying to turn people into neuroscientists. We don't want people shoving pencils in their eyes trying to read a book, right? We want them to understand sim- with simplicity. Here's how the brain is built. Here's how your brain is built. Here's how it makes decisions. And then give them a roadmap Say, now, if you present information, here's the key. Of all the studies we've looked at, PhD researchers on on my staff, all of this, it really comes down to one simple equation. Right information, delivered the right way, but in the right order. That's the key. Are you on, uh, 
like, can I go get your book on Audible? It's not Audible yet. It's Come on, it's on. I man. Know. It's, I know. I keep getting asked about it. It's coming. Damn. It's coming. It's on. Hey, look. Well, where can they buy your book right now? You can go to Amazon right now. Okay, you can't get an Audible version, but you can get the the text version, and you it's called Neuroselling. Neuroselling. I would highly suggest everyone get that book, even if you read it and say, nah, and throw it away. Why? Seek information on a daily basis. You become a more valuable individual. I, I, I'm, I'm getting into reading. I never used to be. What do you think about reading? Re reading activates a different part of your brain, right? The auditory response in the brain to listen to audible, that's one path. Reading actually causes you to activate different areas of the brain. It's, it's helpful. Both are good. Uh, Both do, you, are good. Do, you, do you think people should read and listen to you, uh, the audible at the same time? No. Why? One or the other. Why? One or the other. I, one, because it's hard for your brain to track. You're not catching, you, you're, able to, you're able to listen at your own audible, audible pace and your brain's able to process and picture what you're hearing. When you're trying to read while someone else is reading to you, it just, it almost crisscrosses your wires. Hmm. And it doesn't, you, I, don't, I don't think you retain as much honestly doing that. I don't have any studies to prove that. I'm just telling you my opinion on that. Hey, by the way, he's got a podcast, folks. Driving Change Podcast. Where's that? Apple? Spotify. It's all over. Apple, Spotify, it's everywhere. So just uh, put it in Driving Change Podcast. We got some really cool conversations in there. Yeah. So this dude and his company ultimately help mainly larger companies, but you're prepared to help small ones. We launched this year. We're moving into the space. We're helping individuals, entrepreneurs, and small businesses in large part due to our partnership. Well, that's a that's a lovely partnership, by the way. We'll bring that up. But ultimately, you're helping people understand how to use the neuroscience behind their presentations and it's doing what to, to closing ratios. Oh my gosh. It's, you know, we've got one client that went from under 20% to 70% with their team. And this yeah. is a fortune five company. And this isn't even, this isn't even hard to deliver and understand. Once people get it, they get it. It's a recipe. We should have you on closer school tonight. I don't fly out till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well then maybe we should. You want to do closer school? Totally up to you. I'm here. I'm at your disposal. Let me, I want to serve well, if you. If, you, you, if, you, if you've got, if you've got content that you can deliver to them to where they can learn exactly what you're talking about. And there's a bunch of people in there, business owners. It's just a group. Yep. There's usually 50 on the, on the call. Um, but another 750 go through it, the recording. Yeah. Happy to so, help. So maybe it'll generate you some business too. Happy to help. Sweet. Yeah. I always look for excellent sources of information to deliver to that group because dude, I don't believe everybody should listen to one person and one person only. No, not at all. I think you should get as much information from as many different sources as you can vet it, use it. And I always say, try to disprove it. Yep. And then freaking dude, 10 years from now, you'll be a badass and you'll be a literally an amalgamation of all of the information processed through your personal life and lifestyle. And then you become an individual that is badass. And you might be using a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but listen to it all. So I'd get, I definitely folks go get his book, Neuroselling. I'd also um, follow him real Jeff Bloomfield, but Jeff, if I'm a, a brand new salesperson with a, with a confidence issue, what would you, how, what would you say to me? Your mindset's wrong. So would you, could you help fix that? I can fix it overnight. I can fix How? it right now. I can How? fix it in five minutes. Let's fix it for the listeners. And so there's a lot of folks out well, there. Well, first probably... tell them what a negative mindset or a limited mindset does to you first. Well, let's start by talking about what's the focal point of, of the limited mindset. It's you. It's yourself. It's, so beliefs drive behaviors. And so if I find a salesperson that, does, that lacks confidence, then usually it's one of a couple of things. Number one they, they know in their gut that they're actually not helping their customers or prospects. They're trying to sell them. It doesn't feel good. So they don't want to do it. So therefore that limiting belief of, I know I'm not helping them. I feel like I'm selling them something they may not want or need. So therefore they, they withdraw and they're not good. So they don't have confidence. So the first thing I want people to understand out there is number one, if your mindset is selling, you got it wrong. Your mindset has to be serving by solving. That's number one. When you switch the mindset to others, focused and you learn about your prospects and you understand their world, you understand their story, you understand their goals and objectives and their problems and challenges, 
I can put myself empathetically into the conversation of someone who's there to serve you by helping solve those problems. It's a mindset shift. But the greatest salespeople, the world-class salespeople, that's what they think all day. They don't think about their product. They don't think about their quota. They know it. They don't think about it. They think about how it's going to help somebody solve that problem and the feeling that they're going to get from helping that person solve that problem. That's number one. That's a huge mindset shift for a lot of experienced salespeople. Honestly, they kind of hit ruts, right? They go successful, then they kind of hit ruts. New salespeople, they got the whip cracked, right? They got to learn, 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 product, 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 product. Now go, 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 go. And their whole message comes across self-serving. So then they withdraw and then they start to realize that, hey, maybe sales isn't for me. Well, no, sales is for everyone. Every human being on the planet is a salesperson. The question is, is are you communicating the right information the right way in the right order for mutual benefit? So. Now, what is that right order? So as we mentioned earlier, the biggest difference, and I'll give you an example within neuroselling. The biggest difference is the first thing you've got to do on a human to human interaction is you got to create a connection. Now, let me dispel another sales myth. And I don't want to <clears throat> offend anyone out there who does any other type of sales training programs. Um, we've all been trained on rapport building. What we've learned over the years with, with the science is Rapport building sometimes tends to be, you know, Mr. Prospect, Mrs. Prospect, to see you have a picture of a sailboat on the wall over there. Do you sail? I drink water. Now, can I tell you all about my watches? What we've learned is there's two types of trust. This is so important for people to understand. We know this now from a behavioral psychology, neuroscientific standpoint. <clears throat> there's personal trust and there's professional trust. Personal trust comes from a belief-centered place of me believing subconsciously, unconsciously, that you're authentic, you're honest, you're humble, and you've shown me just enough vulnerability for me to realize that you're trustworthy on a personal level. And then there's professional trust. That's my perception of your credibility, right? Your, your ability to be, to, to, uh, to knowledge, skill, capability, and insight. Professional trust. But what we didn't really understand until the last decade was, we train people to be credible. We train our salespeople to come across knowledgeable, skillful, capable. Therefore, you'll if, be, if we train our people at all. Yeah, well, well, we think we do. The information we give them makes them, and then their self-preservation activates. And so they don't want to look stupid in front of a prospect. So what do they talk about? Highest level of training, my knowledge, my skill, my capability, my product. Personal trustworthiness, that ability to connect on a human level with somebody, not in a cheesy, manipulative way. But man, let me tell you about why I do what I do. Let me tell you about growing up on the farm. Let me tell you about my papal teaching me problem solvers rule the world. Let me tell you the platinum rule. Let me tell you a little story about that because it matters to you because now I get to walk those beliefs out when I meet with people like you and help you every day. And then guess what? When I say, why do you do what you do? You know how many papal stories I've gotten over the last 10 years in return? Thousands of their version of who papal was. It had nothing to do with their resume, nothing to do with their credibility and everything to do with this connection. Once we have a connection on a human level, you'll go anywhere with me because the very next step is I'm going to tell you a story about you. We call it the prospect story. I'm not going to tell you a story about my product. I'm going to tell you a story about how much I know about you. Then I'm going to ask you questions about how you feel about the story I just told you about you. And you're going to give me everything I ever wanted to know at that point. Then I'm going to tell you a problem story. And the whole time I'm just increasing trust and credibility, both personal and professional. And it's your, and it's your, you're leading the conversation as the prospect, but I'm guiding it a hundred percent down the path of ultimately you have a problem. Now you've just told me how you feel about the problem. We've quantified the problem. Now I'm going to help you solve it. That's the order, personal trust, prospect story, problem story. Then you can tell your product solution story. That's the order. And you're teaching people how to develop these? You have to. There's a specific way, right? There's a formula that we've developed that helps you do them kind of quicker without having to overthink it. But usually we jump out of order because we get under pressure. We tell the rapport building opener and then we jump to product and we skip steps. So who would have thought, who would have thunk some farm dude right? from Ohio? So did you go out and start killing it in sales before you learned all this shit? Totally. But I didn't know why. So I'll give you an example. So my first sales role was in biotech where I got uh, my pat ball. Let me tell you the backstory here. This is really important. On February 2nd, 19... So you're, you're doing it to us right now, I am, aren't totally, you? Totally, totally. Yeah. Thanks for blowing my cover. 
but it's relevant, right? We'll, we'll let you behind the curtain here. <laughs> See, folks, pay, listen, I always tell people when it comes to these gurus, don't do what they say, do what they do. In my case, hopefully those two are lying. Yeah, well, again, a lot of times you hear these gurus, they're saying one thing, but they're doing another. And if you just, like I always say, listen with your eyes and you'll see all you need to hear. That's it. So like, don't do what they say, do what they do. And if they're doing what they say, cool, but just do what they do. Like Gary Vee says, you know, uh, one thing, but again, watch what he's doing. Right. Dude, he's telling you. And by the way, he does tell you, he does, he does line. But when it comes to building personal brands, Gary Vee's wonderful at it. Well, someone was on the uh, episode the other day and they're talking about what Gary Vee said. And I said, well, wh what does Gary Vee do? Right. Well, he does. He posts every day, all day. Well, do what he does. Yeah. Don't do what he says in general, in obviously. General. And, and I would hope that. So, so pay attention, folks. What is he doing right now? He's about to take us down memory lane, make us feel, fell, found. Remember that? Feel, felt, found? Yeah, we can talk about that later. But, uh, but uh, keep going, though. I want to hear the story. Well, that's important because on February 2nd, 1982, I got off the school bus to see Papa like I did every day. Normally, it's just his green Chevy Silverado at the end of the driveway. It's full of cars. And the ambulance followed me down the driveway. I didn't get to go in the house. They wouldn't let me in. So I stood out over by the woods, snow, tears coming down my face. They took him out on a stretcher. Last day I'd ever see him alive. He had stage four lung cancer. Seminal, instrumental moment in my life. Changed everything. My dad was a Vietnam vet Marine. Post-traumatic stress syndrome. Opposite relationship. So my mentor was gone like that. But How because, old were you? Uh, I was junior high. So because he wanted me to be the first person in our family to go to college... It drove me to get good grades, to be good in sports, to go on to college. And why I'm telling this story is because I ended up my first sales role, back to your question, I got to help launch a drug for lung cancer. Now, obviously, I was pretty passionate about lung cancer. So I didn't know it, but when I got trained on all the stuff, all the facts, all the data, I knew all that stuff cold. But when I'd go out and talk to oncologists or nurses or nurse practitioners, I told stories about Papal. I connected on a human level. I was passionate about... The four papals I saw in the lobby, in the waiting room when I walked into the office. And I was going to do everything I could to make sure that they had the life-saving drug that I was selling that my papal never had a chance to have. And so my numbers went through the roof. I didn't know why. By the way, the evidence, the data of the drug, it was the reason why you could validate to do what I was asking you to do. The emotional connection, the passion they felt with me and for me and together, that was the, 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 the reason to believe me. To trust me, the drug and its data was then the analytical network's ability to say, I can validate and make a decision because he can prove it with the data, right, with the drug. So if you think about that, you think about how you sell today, whatever it is you're selling. Do I know you care about what I care about? Can I trust you on a personal level? Are you passionate about helping people like me solve problems that I have? And how do I know that? And then how do I know that you care about what I care about? You got to tell me a story about me, not about you, after that. Now you're trustworthy, and then you can lead up to how you can help me solve these problems. That's how the brain is biologically built to process information. So how do you, how do you tell a story about me if you don't know me very well? Do some freaking research. Like, the thing that drives me the craziest about salespeople today. Well, I ain't got no time to do research, bro. The guy walks up, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Whatever you want, stop, hold on a minute. I'm going to go Google you research you a little bit. Wait, what do you mean? You don't have time to do research. I don't have time did, did to do research. Did a prospect just walk in all the, out of the blue into your yeah. office? No, not true. Like you, here's people here, don't get approached by customers. Not very, rarely. I'm talking furniture about furniture salesman, car salesman. Okay. Motorcycle salesman, power sports, Marine. That's RVs. different. That's different, but the same. Let me explain. I was referring to B2B sales where you have time and you've got an objective and you've got a customer base that you're supposed to go call on in retail sales. When you're walking in the door and you're selling, someone's walking in the door to meet with you. Here's what I know. I know that if I'm selling furniture, a husband and wife's going to walk in the door, that every husband and wife that walks in that door, they're looking for something to make them feel a certain way about where they live. They're, how, what, the, how they're going to make that decision, I'll, I'll figure that out by asking great questions. But I got to tell them that I understand, hey, we've had couples come in here every day for the last... 10 years I've been working in here and every time they walk in the door here today, they're excited and they're excited because they have in their mind a vision 
for what they want the room that they're looking for furniture to look like, feel like, because they like to spend time with their family. They like to have neighbors over. They like to actually make that a part of who they are. The furniture is bigger than just a piece of furniture for most couples that walk in the door. Now, let me ask you guys personally, as you walked in the door today, what kind of room are you looking to fill with that kind of an experience for your friend, friends and family? I, I, Living room. I just set them up with saying, this is more than furniture for but, most people. But was that my story? That was a generalized story. But that's how you tell a prospect their story? Exactly. And you, and you frame it the way you want to frame it. You frame it how you want to frame it, but then you ask the question after it. Because, see, here's where salespeople make the mistake is they want to lead with questions because they've been trained. you got to ask questions. Yeah, I, I trained that. Well, you, you, but nobody knows how to ask questions. Well, you got to train them. Well, you, most people ask self-serving leading questions that puts the, the, the prospect in the analytical network, which causes me to wonder what your motive is for the question you're asking. Well, again, the, it's, it's key to point out, like when you're selling B2B or software or, or biotech, you know, it's different sale than, than retail or, or where they're coming to you. You know what I mean? It's a different sale, but it's the same process in the brain. Right. Well, I see how it works. But my point is, is like I teach people to ask questions because like if you just walked up, let's say there's a furniture store. Yep. I need to find out why you're here. Right. So I can, obviously you're looking at furniture. Yeah, they're not there oh, we're looking at furniture today. <laughs> the, but you, how, how, many, even, how many people have you heard ask that question? Well, that's because they're untrained exactly. or unintelligent. But it, the point is, is I, I do teach to ask questions. So how am I, how can I improve? Like, in other words, and I can't wait till you teach closer school. Cause it's like, I tell them ask questions. Well, my steps are very simple. Number one, preparation. Which, right. which is a big umbrella. You should do research. I agree with you. If and when you can, it's not always possible. Uh, if you're better prepared mentally, physically, everything, then obviously your introductions are going to go better. Your meet and greets, whatnot. That usually lasts four or five seconds, you know. But how do you do that? Well, you know, the basics. But then where do you, where do you begin? I say have a conversation because most people, and, I, and what's funny is you said, I say don't try to be a salesperson, be a help person. Like figure out how you could, if, if I look at you when you walk in front of Lightspeed, when I see you, I don't think, oh my God, I'm going to try to close him for 60K deal. Right. I'm going to go, how do I help? Who is this person and right. how do I help? How, let me see if I can help you. You know, so tell me why you're here. What are you trying to accomplish? Why is that happening? What have you saw? What have you tried in the past? Like, why are you here? I need to know that. And what are your problems? Yep. And, 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 and how did that feel? And now I can try to see if my product or service will help you. And, and, and that's why I close a lot of these deals. So we're saying the same thing. But what was interesting is you said, don't ask questions. Well, what do you do first? No, no, no. I, let me make sure I'm clear. I didn't say don't ask questions. It's when to ask the question. But, you, but first, I'm supposed to do my story, your story. No, no. Again, I was given a formula that works really well in a B2B setting. Probably, if I'm working at a furniture store or an RV dealer or boat store, I'm, I'm probably not going to just launch and say, Hey, welcome. You know, welcome to, to Brad's RV world. Uh, let me tell you about my papa. I grew up on a farm. <laughs> I'm probably not going to do that. Right. Do I'm, you have a papa? That's what <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> right. Uh, what, what I'm going to, you're right. Retail setting is different. What I want people to understand is there's a concept with questions. It's, it's known as instinctive elaboration. It's a voodoo around behavioral psychology. What it means is when I ask a question, when you ask a question, it, it absolutely shuts down every other part of your brain and causes it, that question to hijack your entire focal point. You can't think of anything else but the answer to that question. That's the beauty of asking a great question. The problem is we tend to ask, again, self-serving, self-leading questions in an environment that the prospect is already a little bit skeptical because you walk up to me and immediately engage me at the furniture store and I'm immediately thinking to myself, this guy's trying to screw me. This guy's going to end up trying to screw me, right? You can't help it. That's self-preservation. <laughs> yep. It is. So you got to make that connection first. And, and, I, and I don't disagree with you on how you, everybody's got their own way of doing that. But eventually you, you still, I would say, follow your, your protocol because if I can connect at a human level as we're wandering around the store, if we're using furniture salesmen as the example, right? by the time we're five, 10 minutes in, I should be telling you about my papa uh, or pal. We, you, what is you, it? Papa. Pa papa. Papa. Yeah. You're weaving it in, right? You're weaving it in because the, it's the beliefs that matter. 
it's the hard work, it's the problem solving, it's the platinum rule. Those are the, those are the things you want to weave in to make the person feel at ease that you're trustworthy. But let me give you one point on what you said earlier. I think it's important. Prospect stories don't have to be five minute stories. They can be a single sentence. And so if they walk in the door, a couple walks in the door of the furniture store and I said, Hey, you know, welcome to Brad's, you know, furniture couches are us. I'm Jeff and I'm, I'm going to hear, I'm going to, I'm here to serve you. Um, you know, a lot of couples that walk in the door, they're here because they've got a vision in their mind to change a room in their house. that's going to change the dynamic of the way that they entertain their family and friends. What brought you guys in today? What are you looking, which room are you looking to? Kitchen. Th then I'm going to, then I'm going to go. Good, okay. That's a good opening question. Right. Then I'm going to say, great. Why don't you tell me about what you're, kitchen looks like currently today and then what you'd like your kitchen to look like tomorrow in an ideal world. And I can see if I can pull some ideas out of the old think later. And so what I'm doing is I'm painting the picture, but I'm allowing them to respond with visual, visual. Don't ask me non-visual questions. Ask me questions that, that actually evoke emotion and visualization because that bypasses my analytical skeptical part of my brain. But what happens if they give you a real specific vision and you, you can't fulfill it? then you can't fulfill it. But why'd you make me get so specific in my head? Well, are you, gonna, are you, are you truly there to serve them by solving the problem they came in for? Or are you trying yeah, to sell them something that they don't need or want? Both. That's not how I roll. And, and again, need or want, you're making it sound dramatic. Like, dude, I want a couch that does this, that, and the other thing. Well, you don't have one, and nor does it exist. I still need a fucking couch. But now you got me thinking, I'm going to keep looking for this big, you know, diamond tuck, high back velvet, because you just made me picture the perfect damn couch for this section where if it wasn't so specific, maybe I could have filled it. Like, like, like when we were selling cars yeah. back in the day, people would say, you know, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a 94, 94 Ford F-150. Uh, does it have to be a 94? Yep, has to be a 94. See what I'm saying? Now I, now I just eliminated the 93s, the 95s. Like, I'm, uh, you can't, now I'm too Notice specific. Notice how I asked the question about the kitchen. How about what if I just got you a, a, a truck that you were happy with? Even Would better. that be good? And he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm open to look. No, even better. What are you trying to do with the truck? Pull my boat. Great. Now, I got a world of trucks that are going to help you pull your boat. Now, let's, tell me about your boat. What do you love? You fish? Do you boat? Tell me how big it is. Tell is that, me how much it weighs. Is like, that where you're? Is that where you're building rapport? Uh, no, it's actually I'm actually asking questions that matter because the bigger the boat, the bigger the truck they need, the bigger the engine, the bigger the you know the the the, the, the pulling the pulling power. The point on the kitchen question wasn't to I didn't I noticed I didn't ask them. Hey, what specific? T are you looking for a gas range or are you looking for an electric range? So I asked them to paint me a picture of what their kitchen would look like tomorrow in an ideal world. Do you think I can't fill that need? Of course I can. Yeah, and they when they wouldn't usually get specific anyway. I'm just throwing you curveballs. Yeah, but that's it, right? But point on it is, is ask them to paint you the emotional visual vision they have for what they're trying to solve. Yeah. What are you trying to create with your kitchen? Don't yeah, tell they, me you're you know, trying to cook food. A little breakfast nook, you know, a little breakfast nook, maybe a maybe some sort of island. We're looking for an island. You know, that that they, they're not going to get. I want a red leather table exactly. with black chairs and chrome legs. Exactly. Sometimes maybe and maybe not, but by that, th then you can start to ask some connecting questions around. Well, if you're wanting an island, you probably got people that sit around the island. You got kids? Well, if they got specific, you know what I'd say? Oh, you want custom? Follow me. We better have a seat. Those can <laughs> those can be spendy. That's true. Well, the, see, as you're going, what you're getting into on the retail side is asking questions that lead somebody to additional opportunity that maybe they hadn't thought about unconsidered needs is huge and world-class salespeople do that not to sell them more. That's the result. They do it to actually serve them better because maybe there are things they hadn't thought about. Maybe there are opportunities and ideas that they hadn't considered. I'm a visual guy and I'm a creative guy. My wife is a very tangible, tactical person. Um, she has to have ideas presented to her in a way that gets her to see beyond what she had walking through the door. Or otherwise you're never going to, you know, she just, she's built different. Her brain's built differently from that standpoint. But the way you ask those questions could be good for both myself and my wife. It's just all about the back to the earlier question you asked about with salespeople. If you really are trying to ask questions that lead them to a sale, I promise you, you're going to get a sale sometimes, but you're going to lose more than you, than you win. 
if you're leading them through the, the art of questioning down the path, it's really truly helping them open up their mind to what's possible and that you can fill that in, in a way that they've never had filled before, whether it's furniture, cars, RVs, software, then they're going to look at you differently. And they're, you're, they're going to be open to spending more money with you because they trust you. Are you dropping this knowledge on your social media? Yeah. Bits and nuggets? Yeah. yeah. If you go to LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn <clears throat> and, and, and Jeff Bloomfield, Facebook, and are Instagram. You, are you big on LinkedIn? Oh, yeah. Jeff Bloomfield on LinkedIn, folks. And by the way, you know, you got, you got business problems. 90% of problems can be solved with sales. Sales, sales cures a multitude of sins. Sure does. Because <laughs> when you're starting to make that money, man, because like here, I'm like, my processes need to be better. And, you know, but the more sales you make, the more experts you can hire. Like right. money solves a lot of those problems. Now, you also do like leadership. Yeah. Or is it all sales? No, no, it's a lot. We do a lot. Um, the guy who's my president of our company, Dan Doherty, he's got his PhD in, in coaching based on a neuroscience with a neuroscience focus. And what we've learned a lot with, with coaching is coach leadership is coach. To me, coaching is the language of leadership. If you don't know how to coach, you're not really a good leader. Yeah. Um, you can be a good dictator or you can be a dictator, but you can't be a good leader. So as long as you're not a spectator, don't be a spectator. Um, unless you're a dictator, then you might as well be a spectator because nobody's going to listen to you anyway. Um, coaching really comes down to the art of back to communicating effectively. Yeah. And I'll give you a good, for all those who are out there who lead some form of teams, I know we have a lot of individuals out there, but maybe you have people report to you. Have you ever asked this, and I'm going to ask you this question too. Have you ever asked anyone on your team that reports to you this question? Hey, Brad, are you open to some feedback? Yes. Most of us have asked that question. Now, I want you to think about this from a neuro standpoint. Whenever you've been asked that question, what's your subconscious brain immediately thinking? Feeling? It's going to be negative. Totally. They're about to tell me, why I suck at something. And so something negative. It is totally going to be negative, right? Yeah, you mind if I give you some feedback? Right. That's like, you know, hey, hey I'm, negative. I'm about to tell you your baby's ugly, right? Yep. Um, and so that's, a, again, from a, from, a, from a behavioral psychology standpoint, as a coach, we've been trained to ask that question. And it actually puts the person completely into self-preservation, risk mitigation. How do I start to figure out a way to justify why I did what I did in this situation to get out from under this heavy hand of this coach's feedback? And it doesn't allow them to be open to listening to you as a coach, as a developer of people. How should I say it? First of all, you should be giving <clears throat> forward, forward coaching. You should be coaching forward, not backwards. The balance of rear view mirror versus windshield as a coach is huge. Most coaches spend more time in the rear view mirror trying to correct behaviors instead of in the windshield trying to coach behaviors before they happen. See, if I can coach you ahead of time, before you go meet with a prospect, if I'm coaching salespeople, or it doesn't really matter. If we can develop scenarios, we can think and I can get you to have a shared vision. And this is important for coaches out there. What's your, here's, here's my question for anyone listening. What's your business's vision? What's your company vision? Now, what's your leadership vision? And if anybody works for you, do you know what their personal vision is? Those three visions, the, the aligned shared vision is the magic formula for a successful culture. What I find is, most employees get left behind. They don't ever get to talk about their personal vision because their, their manager doesn't care. And they don't care because they don't care. They care. They don't care because they're busy. And when they're busy, they coach for compliance. And not that, only that, but like you're being paid. You, you, your vision is not important here or, or, or give me my money back and contribute. But like if I'm paying somebody, isn't it my vision that matters? No. Why? That's, that's, well, it's not just your vision that matters. If you want a world-class culture, if you want people to, so let's go back and solve the problem. If we have people inside our organizations that are not performing to their highest capabilities, that's a leadership issue. More micro, have you ever heard anybody say, I'm so tired of being micro-coached? Never. They only say, I don't like to be micromanaged. Well, management, you can't manage people. You can manage process. You have to lead people. So if I don't, but if I don't understand your personal vision for your life, I'll never put you in a situation to perform it at a high level in my company to help you succeed that and accomplish that personal what vision. What if my vision is to go hiking in the Grand Tetons? Well, that's, that's an activity. 
It's not a vision. I mean, what's the vision for your life? Why are you working here? What are you doing with the money that you're paycheck. making here? I got to feed the kids, man. Okay. Well, that's an important vision. How are we doing at accomplishing that vision? Are they getting fed? Would you like to feed them more? Because you make more money here if you work at a higher performance level. But I need to understand your vision, which is you bring up a good point, Brad. We don't know how to help people think about their personal vision. They don't know. If you ask, if we went around right now in Lightspeed and I started asking everybody here, hey, what's your personal vision for your life? I'd probably get a bunch of blank stares. Not because it's a, a leadership issue. People don't act, they don't know to think like that. You should do it after the podcast. <laughs> we should have fun with that. Um, it, but if you really get to, if I, if I have responsibility for you on my team, I need to know what winds your crank. I need to know it. I need to know because that's what, how I can help motivate you, how I can help you use this as a career to get to where you're trying to go with that in that personal vision part of your life. And you will perform at a higher level. Sure. I promise you my team, and I'm not great at this. Dan's phenomenal at it because I'm a little bit more of a driver. I got to be really careful um, because I'm a performer. I'm a driver. I'm an accomplisher. Um, and I have to really slow down and spend the extra 10 minutes caring about people on my team because I do genuinely care about them. But because I'm on the treadmill, I can communicate like I only care about the company vision yeah. and leave them behind. Well, we, we probably all are guilty of that. Every, every one of us. Because in my mind, like, you know, I do care about people and what their vision is. But if their vision doesn't happen to align, I'm still paying them. Like, just get the job done, son. Just get the job done. They just may not be here long term. Yeah. It's just it's going to make a worse, less than ideal culture, right. family, network. So I, but most visions, if you think about it, Brad, most people's personal vision, that are employees, they, they want to work at a place that makes them feel like they're making a difference yeah. and that they can provide for their family. Yeah. And, now, now, and nowadays they want to see a path to something bigger, right? Yeah. Opportunity. And it's so it's not always money, man. These, no. you, 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 a lot of these employers, they just give people more money, more money. And they still leave. They're like, man, I'm paying them top right. dollar. Well, you're not doing some of those things. You're not worried about who they are, where they want to go, and you're not leading them. You're freaking managing them. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't ultimately work. It might work in the short term, just like parenting. Same, same thing with parenting. Like you can, you can fly off the handle and demand your kid do something and they'll do it in the moment, but it'll probably damage the relationship to some degree and they'll never truly feel like you care about what they care about. Now, at some point, sometimes you got to do that, right? Because something needs to happen and you didn't do something three times in a row. Well, you're going to get the boot. You should write a parenting book. <laughs> we'll go neuro parenting, right? Well, we'll be a cottage industry. Um, the second book, Story Based Selling. That was the first book, actually. Well, this, <clears throat> this says book number one was neuro selling. Book number two, so my team... I need to go find out what their vision is. Yeah, you probably don't have a shared vision, so they're just half-assing it. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so your first book then, story-based selling, that's using the papas and using the, the, the formula you spoke about earlier. No, the formula really is, was perfected in neuroselling. I'll, I'll be transparent and vulnerable. It's confession time. When You're I started, people just jump to neuroselling. When I started uh, the company almost 11 years ago now, I had a big client hire me, and I went in, did the voodoo that I do, you know, it's back in the day when it was just Jeff, his brain and a flip chart and a marker and all my experience and all the research. And I'd go in and kind of help these companies. And I had a VP of sales go, do you have, a, have this stuff in a book? I'm like, no, I don't have time for a book. I just started a company. I got no time to write a book. And he's like, really, it'd be great if you just wrote some of this stuff down in a book. I'm like, I, I really don't have time. He goes, all right, we'll buy 500 copies. I said, give me three months. <laughs> and so that's where story-based selling was birthed out of this initial of, Hey, let me just get some of these concepts around story and visualization and all that in a book. Um, it's a good book. I don't think it's near the book neuroselling is so you can buy them both out there. Um, but neuroselling is a real practical field manual for how to do this. And story-based selling is more of a conceptual book on how to communicate using visual storytelling. So if somebody's just j jumping into sales or doesn't have a lot of freaking money you know, the book will teach you how to do all this. If you want to, you know, go the next level up, go to braintrustgrowth.com. Yeah. That's where you want to go. If you've got a business, a company that you need. What about the individuals? That's where you're going to want to go to brain trust Academy. Well, what, well what, 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 what's your website? So our company website's braintrustgrowth.com. Right. Cause I mean, I should be able to get everything there. Well, you can go through I'm, what, 
what I'm trying to do here, Brad, is I'm trying to lead people down the path to the Brain Trust Academy, which is part of Brain Trust growth. I know, well, when, in marketing, you can create specific landing pages, talk about specific benefits for the, the differences. But these listeners, you know, if they're if they're businesses and they go to Brain Trust Growth, they might end up being one of your biggest clients. But if they're individuals and they go to Brain Trust Growth, they should see the individual option. No. They will. They got to go somewhere else. Hey, do you do you know that we just are you're launching Brain both, Trust Academy you're right now? Both like, parts of my brain go off at the no, same no, time. No, no, you you only have. I've, I've known you well enough. You only have one part of your brain. Which one? So it's, okay. Is it the amygdala? <laughs> or is it the medulla oblongata? It's the medulla oblongata. Yeah. Cerebrum. Mama shares. Mama shares. Brushing my teeth. Crocodiles. You pulled out a little Bobby Boucher there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will be able to go as an individual from Brain Trust Growth to Brain Trust Academy. The, the reason why we built Brain Trust Academy with your help this past several months is because we didn't have an option for individuals, for entrepreneurs, or really small businesses. We only had an option for our big programs for large companies. Yeah. So now the Academy is going to be that. Well, you're going to probably make more off the Academy than you will these big companies. Eventually, absolutely. Yeah, you I just got to get it out there. I think that's Because, uh, you know, big companies, they spend a ton of money. Then three, three years later, they'll spend a ton more with someone else right. three years later. But at the end of the day... To properly train effectively, you can go figure out if there's any neuroscience attached to this, but I think there is. You need four key ingredients. Number one, good content. Correct. If you teach them effectively to do it wrong with bad content, they'll do it wrong. So you have to have the right way to do it in the first place. There's good content. Then you need repetition. Then you need practice. Then you need accountability. And most of these companies that are exposing their people to good information, keynotes from you, you know, a book. Most people read a book one time. Right. So the Brain Trust Academy, I think, is not only going to make you more because it's scalable. You can have 10,000 small businesses accessing that platform and tapping into you from a, from a virtual level, increasing their sales, become big companies. And now that even feeds the bigger, exactly. uh, uh, higher price tickets. But- so not only is it more scalable, but I'll bet you it's going to end up being more effective, more effective because, because well, if they use it right, because the system allows them to basically have Jeff Bloomfield on staff 24 seven and your whole team to train, track, measure, monitor, practice, role play each one of their people with repetition, practice, and then the reporting is accountability. If I hired you to come in and do a one day workshop, I just assume everybody's listening I just assume everybody got it because I used to go out and train companies and I'd be talking to the, you know, the group after four hours and I'd be like, you know what I mean? And they'd be like, yeah, that's good. That's right. gold. And I'm like, yeah, it's good. Right. And you know, my ego is all pumped up. Everyone thinks I'm awesome because I'm giving them kick-ass word tracks. And I literally leave thinking, dude, that was the best right. freaking course I've ever. I killed it. I killed it. <laughs> and then a week later, the owner is calling me, dude, what the hell did you say to my team? You know, they're, they're, they ain't they're doing anything. Right. Not, nothing's happened. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. And I, and I go in there and they're doing the exact opposite of what I said. Right. I'm like, wait a minute, dude, I told you this, you're doing this. Well, I, I forgot, but you know, repetition, 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 accountability. Now they're going to freaking get trained effectively. And I'll bet you there's some neuroscience to that. Absolutely. The, the repetition. So first of all, content is something to, I've got to believe that the content, the knowledge the information I'm receiving has value beyond this just being another fill in the blank that I've gone through. So the con to your point, great content that's different has to be there because then the brain goes, okay, I see value here. The repetition piece and the practice piece, when the brain creates a new habit, it has to have those things to create a new neural pathway. The more times you, you do something over and over again, you create literally through neuroplasticity, new neural pathways in your brain that fire, when neurons fire together, they wire together and create a new pathway. That's a habit. So if you don't have the repetition, you'll never form the habit, which means you'll just be like a box of bottle rockets getting lit and shooting off different. And that's why you see so many people do things sometimes intuitively, but rarely intentionally. That's where the repetition, the practice wires in that habit literally in your brain. Folks, that's what I'm talking about. Now, if you're not already following them, go follow them at real Jeff Bloomfield. Go to braintrustgrowth.com. If you're an individual, you want to kick ass, go to Braintrust Academy. 
com. But more importantly, do check him out on LinkedIn. That's where you're putting a lot of this content for businesses. Get his book, Neuro Selling. Dude, I appreciate you coming in here, sharing the knowledge. That was my honor. I my hope honor. I hope that uh, you can stick around or come back for Closer School Live. It'd be great. Love to help any way I can. Well, what I want to do is basically just introduce you and let you teach them anything you want. Isn't that crazy that I do that? I can mess up a lot of people. It'd be fun. <laughs> well, I think uh, it'd be valuable because let me tell you guys and everyone listening, the at the end of the day, the better you understand human behavior and science-based, how the brain works, what you're automatically it, 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 wired to do, the more advantage you have in business, period. Relationships, you know, yep. the better you understand people, and how and the better you can communicate with that understanding, the bigger advantage you have in life. It's huge. It's crazy. Well, folks, share this out with everybody. Go rate it. We're getting higher and higher in the uh, podcast ratings. And the reason why I want to go higher and higher, and the only way I can do that is if you uh, go share and brag about it, post it on social media. The reason I want to go higher and higher is because I, I reach more people. My show gets more power. And I can keep getting guys like this to come in here and drop knowledge to you fools for free. So until next time, apply this shit, go out and try to disprove it and keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.